All right, let's do it for real this time. So here we are, and as you can tell by the title, that's right, the day has finally come. Stabilize is going to talk about Minecraft in Smash Brothers. Originally, I'd planned to include Steve in another compilation video with a bunch of characters, but it turns out I just have way too much to say on the topic. Minecraft's main protagonist and playable character, known simply as Steve, has got a lot of fans on his side fighting for his addition to Ultimate's roster. But on the other side of the Enchanted Book, there's a mob of polygonal prosecutors who would rather see the entire Earth go up in flames than see that stupid square man in my Smash Brothers! Right. So anyway, today I'm going to take a long hard look at Steve and see if he has what it takes to strafe jump his way into Fighters Pass 2 or if he'll be more likely to fall straight into the me costume lava pit of no return. But before we get into all that, I'd like to take a good look at Minecraft's past and see what exactly makes this game such an important piece of still ongoing gaming history. Keep in mind that I may skip over a few details here and there for the sake of simplicity, but I'll still be going over all the major stepping stones that have led us to the Minecraft we have nowadays. You thought you were gonna get away with not learning something today, didn't ya? Well that's too bad, class is in session, take your seats and quiet down! No matter what any of us think, Nintendo has always been at the top of the list when it comes to being unpredictable. So it's not really about whose predictions are right or wrong, the fun simply lies in discussing the possible future for a game that we all love. Feel free to let me know what your thoughts are about Minecraft coming to Smash in the comments down below, or for a more active conversation, come on over to our fancy schmancy stabilized Discord. Remember to give the video a like if you enjoyed it, and feel free to subscribe to see more videos like this one. But without any further ado, let's get into it. In the beginning, there was nothing. And then, there was blocks. We can talk directly about Steve's chances of joining the Smash roster in a bit, but Minecraft has a legacy, and to me, that's always an important part of a character's inclusion in Smash. So by looking at the history of Minecraft, we can see how Steve spent the last 10 years becoming the king of games, and give good context to his inclusion in the Smash roster. As I'm sure most of you know, Minecraft was and still is an absolute gaming phenomenon. Although the development of the game was a bit unconventional for the time, it quickly shot into the limelight despite its indie game status, and in a lot of ways led the charge for indie games to become the thriving part of the industry that they are today. And it all began with this Swedish delight. Marcus Persson, better known as Notch, started working on making a video game as a hobby between 2008 and 2009. He first made a prototype for a building simulation game, which he called Ruby Dunge, and this is where our Minecraft journey begins. There's not a whole lot that is known about Ruby Dunge, and only a handful of screenshots still remain of the project, but it's clear that it was a fairly simple isometric builder game inspired by one of Notch's favorite games at the time, Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress was a management simulator where the player controlled a colony of dwarves using sandbox style gameplay. That is to say, there is no real way to win in Dwarf Fortress. The player is able to decide what their objectives are and do whatever they want within the confines of the game to have fun suited to their own gameplay tastes. This open-ended design was very important to Notch, and of course would show up as an integral element of Minecraft in the years to come. But for now, Notch had only just begun work on his builder game prototype and was having trouble moving forward. Even with Dwarf Fortress as a fuel to his fire, Ruby Dunge wasn't really going anywhere, and Notch soon looked elsewhere for inspiration. That elsewhere happened to be the forums at TIG Source. It was on TIG Source where he became commonly known by his online alias of Notch. And it was also here that he came across a newer and even bigger inspiration for what would eventually become Minecraft than Dwarf Fortress was. An open source project known as Infiniminer. Haha, <laughs> get it? Because you did it forever? Haha! <laughs> There's pretty limited lasting information on Infiniminer, but I've done my best to gather everything I could that is relevant to our main man Notch. Like seriously, one of the main things I've found is this webpage from 2009. Why does this still exist? Infiniminer was only worked on by its original developers, Zachtronics, for a little over a month. This is because the code of the game was completely unencrypted, leading to people creating their own altered versions of the game and splitting the already small community even more from the compatibility issues. In the time that it was being played though, Infiniminer was a game that had a similar block-based style to what Minecraft would end up using, as well as procedurally generated maps and a first-person perspective. 
The goal of the game was a lot different from Minecraft though, and had a much more competitive approach. Players would group up and face off to find medals in the ground, then bring them back up to the surface and earn points for their team. Notch really enjoyed the cave exploration and building elements of Infiniminer, and decided to scrap Ruby Dunge's original isometric design to move towards the first person style. Infiniminer was proof that a builder game could actually work in first person and still use a grid based system. Just simply adjust the grid to become three-dimensional blocks that can surround the player in all directions. This perspective also had the benefit of making cave exploration much easier to design for. With a first-person view, you don't have to worry about trying to find a way to maintain the top-down nature of your game without the camera being blocked by the top layer of the ground when the player is underneath it. So thanks to Infiniminer, Notch now had the tools he needed to move forward on making his very own cave game. Which, by the way, is what the preliminary forums of Minecraft were called. Even after borrowing so many designs, design elements from Infiniminer though, Notch did have his own plans for Minecraft's gameplay as well. Mostly being that he wanted to distance his game from the competitive nature of Infiniminer in favor of adding more RPG-like adventuring elements. So over the next few months, Notch freely released a few builds of his cave game to the public over on the TIG Source forums, and that was more than enough to get everyone excited. These were mostly test builds of the game's main mechanics and engine, as well as a couple enemies. But in December of 2009, it happened. What many people consider to be the first ever complete version of Minecraft was released, known simply as the in development or in dev build. InDev was a real milestone for Minecraft, as it included the first non-tester survival build of the game. Suddenly, Minecraft was no longer just a block simulator for building cool structures, or testing monsters, or diving into caves. And it was in the InDev build that players first saw the full implementation of gameplay elements that the series has since made a name for itself with. Diamonds? Pickaxes? And of course, the holy grail of gaming, crafting! All made their debut in some version of the InDev build. This build of the game was also the first time that Notch put the game up for sale on his website. And even with the plague of piracy that was rampaging across the internet in 2010, the game was a massive success. Yarr! When life gives you limes and wires, remember to support the artists behind the projects that you enjoy! Yarr! Yarr! The game was so successful in the coming months, Notch was able to begin working on the game full time by June of 2010, and the game was able to officially enter its alpha phase. And the original alpha phase that happened before the in-dev build was released in December was renamed to Minecraft Classic. Uh, yeah. Are you getting all this? Because there will be a test! So yes, you heard me right. The game was gaining popularity at an alarming pace with its recently implemented adventuring gameplay, but was still only being referenced to as an alpha version. Sure, the game was now being sold, but according to Notch, he was nowhere near having implemented all the features he felt were necessary to constitute Minecraft being called a complete game. This dynamic actually ended up working in his favor though. By constantly updating the game for free, people who had already paid for it would be able to play in the early stages and know that there was more things to come in the future. And for those who hadn't paid yet? Well, they were continually being faced with a more tempting offer. The game was being sold at the same price, but had bigger and better features as time went on. This business model was part of the reason that Minecraft was able to become so successful. Instead of Notch having to develop the game on his own time and money, and hoping and praying to make his investment back once the game was released, he was able to get the money from the fans up front and fund the development of the game as it was happening. Not to mention the valuable feedback of players who were helping to find bugs or suggest other improvements that Notch was instantly able to adjust for. This model has been used in a few other places since Minecraft, but you've probably never really heard much about it. The only one I can think of was some small project I heard about in passing. It was quite a while ago, I haven't heard anything about it since. Oh yeah, that's right, Steam Early Access. Minecraft was the flagship title to make early access gaming the huge part of the industry that it is today. Love it or hate it, through the early access model, more indie game developers than ever have been able to get off the ground thanks to the support of gamers around the world. And I can't even begin to think about how many games wouldn't have been able to be developed without the popularization of this business model 
model for the industry. This is one of the biggest reasons that Minecraft will always be the poster boy for indie games around the world. It set the standard to provide opportunity for developers everywhere to do what they love, and they can all strive to reach the heights that Minecraft has in its indie endeavors. It was clear that Minecraft was making huge waves in the gaming realm, and its popularity only continued to grow. This in-dev version of Minecraft is actually what I happened to stumble upon way back in the day, and although it was an entire decade ago, I still have some very vivid memories of my experience with the game during this time period. It was completely unlike anything I had ever played before, and almost came across as magical. Magic. Seriously though, the idea of sitting down to play a game and having no definitive goal other than to survive was something I was completely unfamiliar with. I didn't grow up on Dwarf Fortress like Notch did, so I was used to trying to become the strongest Pokemon trainer or stop Dr. Eggman's evil plot. I never had a game that just looked straight at me and said, play. I spent the next few years making memories in this blocky world off and on again. It's really hard to forget the first time you build a house or find diamonds. <sighs> Yes. Yes. I remember how the updates would always keep me coming back to experience what was new with the game, and the way rumors would spread through my school about how to most easily find the new items or best fight specific enemies. And more than anything, I remember the day Minecraft was released on Xbox 360. This was practically a national holiday. Things changed. Everyone who could was already playing Minecraft, but the Xbox port really helped it hit the mainstream. Having the game on Xbox gave every single one of my friends a way to play together, not just the limited few of us who had computers at the time. We'd rush home after school and play all night before meeting up in class the next morning to talk about what happened or what we were going to do next. Our shared adventures in Minecraft was what turned us all from boys to men. <coughs> there was hours and hours of laughter and pain, having your pirate ship burned down by someone you thought was your friend. I mean, it changes you, man. I, I trusted you, Larry, you fat son of a bitch. It's been eight years and I still don't forgive you. My point is that Minecraft was a game that my group of friends really could do anything we wanted to in. And I'm sure that by now, the game probably has things a hundred times crazier that can be accomplished by a couple of pals. Minecraft really is more than just a game. It's an experience. And at that, it's an experience that can be enjoyed by almost anyone, especially with ports of the game appearing on Xbox, PlayStation, mobile phones even. The sandbox nature of Minecraft's go anywhere, do anything gameplay means that getting the game to as many people on as many different platforms as possible was a huge benefit for the game. The simplicity of the early moments in the world allow for almost anyone to get hooked once they get their hands on it. If someone unfamiliar with gaming in general begins by gathering wood and learning to craft simple recipes, they could quite easily decide that they have more than enough at their disposal to have an enjoyable experience. Using wooden tools to gather resources and create a log cabin on the beach could be their entire end goal not even looking at the other 99% of features that Minecraft has to offer. Does that mean that the player is somehow playing the game wrong? Of course not. The beauty of sandbox games like Minecraft is you get to decide how you want to enjoy the experience. And I think the accessibility is yet another reason that Minecraft was able to become the overwhelming hit that it is today. And yes, that's right, it is still a hit to this very day. And on that note, I think it's about time we address the moosh room in the room. I hate to generalize, but in my experience, there's been a lot of resistance in the older side of the Smash community whenever the idea of adding Steve to Smash comes up, which I don't really understand. I know we may have already had our fill of adventuring in Minecraft, but that doesn't change the fact that the game still exists and thrives to this day. The game has been continually updated and arguably improved over the last 10 years, so it makes sense that people in this same age group are still playing and enjoying it when there is well, even more to play and enjoy. Now, you may have grown out of Minecraft, and that's totally fine. I kind of have too. You don't have to play the same game for 10 years, and there's probably characters that you'd rather have in Smash Brothers that suit your interests more. But that doesn't mean Minecraft has stopped being an incredible game that millions of people are still playing. Get down off your polygonal high horse for a second and look at the facts. Are we that obsessed with trends and social waves that we have to look down on someone for having an appreciation for something that we've already had our fill of? What about that situation makes us superior to them? Imagine how you'd feel if you threw a Led Zeppelin album on, just have your dad burst into your room like, no, stop that, turn that off, you can't like that. You weren't even there.
The point I'm trying to make is, just because we enjoyed something in our teenage years, why should that mean it can't still also be enjoyed by teenagers today? If anything, I'm glad that a game as innovative and influential as Minecraft is still receiving the love and praise it deserves to this day. Let's remember that we are talking about the best-selling video game of all time here. It's hard to say it doesn't at least deserve to be a part of the Smash conversation. I've already gone over all the impact that Minecraft has had on the gaming industry as a whole, so surely the block-based builder should be a shoe-in for some Smash Brothers representation, right? Well, I think it's about time we take a look at the polygonal protagonist himself, Minecraft Steve. So because of the fact that Minecraft is a primarily first-person game, Steve doesn't get a whole lot of screen time unless you're digging through the world with a friend. There is a third-person toggle if you want to get a feel for Steve's personality a little bit more while you play, but it's not likely you'll be spending much time using it because it makes Minecraft's gameplay a little bit more... challenging. Steve is the default skin for the player character, and was given the name by Notch himself as a joke, though his name was officially added into the game later on. There's also a default female skin, named Alex, who I think would be likely to appear alongside Steve if he does secure a spot in Smash, similar to the male and female variants of the Fire Emblem characters. With a similar player avatar status to them, I think it would be just as appropriate to fit Steve and Alex in as a fighter together rather than something like a Mii costume. As easy as it would be to give a Mii sword fighter a blocky outfit with a diamond sword, I think a game as influential and absolutely gigantic as Minecraft deserves a bit more. I don't think it'd feel right to give the best-selling video game ever a simple Mii costume, especially not after after ignoring it for so long. In a lot of ways, I think the fact that we don't have a Mii costume for Steve yet is a positive sign for the likelihood of his inclusion as a fighter. If you don't know what I'm getting at yet, think about it using this logic, which I've appropriately dubbed the Mii Costume Cuphead Theory. Let me paint a picture for you. Banjo was added to Smash, and Microsoft is very happy with the result. Microsoft is then later approached by Nintendo again, asking if they would like to give another character to the game, this time for use as a Mii costume. How likely would Microsoft then be to choose Cuphead to give to Smash instead of Minecraft's Steve? Minecraft is a much larger property that is more recognizable and has a wider fan base, so why add Cuphead to Smash as a costume instead? Well, admittedly, this could be due to political or copyright type problems between the studios involved, Involved, but I think there's another much more interesting option. What if there wasn't a choice to be made between Cuphead and Steve at all? They couldn't choose Steve for a Mii costume because he was already off the table. That is, they didn't have the option to make Steve a Mii costume because he was already in development as a full-blown fighter. It makes sense in my book, but I'd love to know what you guys think about this possibility too. Sakurai himself has talked about how he enjoys Minecraft and considers the design to be genius. Every small action has a payoff in the future, which makes the simple task of chopping wood or digging exciting. Could this kind of a future payoff mechanic work in a Smash character's design? Perhaps there could be a way to collect minerals throughout a match, allowing you to craft and upgrade your equipment from wooden tools all the way up to diamond. I personally see Steve as having a moveset similar to Villagers, where he uses a bunch of different tools as attacks and specials in all different directions. Either way, it seems like Sakurai has an appreciation for the game and would no doubt love to have Steve as an inclusion. With Microsoft already in the conversation with Banjo being added to the game and even a Cuphead Mii costume, which is almost more surprising than Banjo himself, it seems like Steve could be a lot closer than most people think. Steve is a worthy inclusion that has a multitude of tools and unique items that could really make him stand out from the rest of the cast. I also think that seeing Steve in Ultimate's engine with dynamic facial expressions and smooth animations would be really, really cool. A lot of people seem to think Steve is too blocky and stoic to be a character in Smash, but we've already seen Minecraft characters with smooth animations and facial expressions and things like Minecraft Story Mode, and that game looks great. Something similar could definitely work in Smash, even if he is a blocky blocky boy. So where does that leave us? Well, Smash Brothers has become a celebration of not just Nintendo games, but video games as a whole. This makes disregarding the best-selling video game of all time seem a bit odd, and I'm not sure that this is something that Smash can keep up in the months to come. Whether we get a full character or just a Mii costume like some people seem to think, we are definitely going to have to get something Minecraft related before we see the end of Ultimate's updates. I may not have any personal attachment to Minecraft in the past five years or so, but this character would still be over the moon exciting for me. With a huge gaming empire that has spanned the last decade, it's clear to me that the only proper choice 
is Steve for Smash, baby. That's gonna do it for me today, guys, but make sure to let me know what you think in the comments down below or in my Discord. Also, feel free to head over to my Twitch page where I'm live every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thanks a lot, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye for now.